Well, thanks very much, Dave. We're looking um, this morning at, uh, as you've already heard, we're starting a series on 1 John, which is the first letter of John. Uh, and I've been given the job of introducing the book and speaking on the first chapter. I've entitled this sermon Back to Basics because that's what John was concerned with. Um, the basic non-negotiables of our faith, uh, as contained in the creeds, um, that Jesus loves us. He died on the cross for us. He really did die. It was a physical death. Um, he rose from the dead. He appeared to a great many people over a 40-day period. He ascended into heaven, where he dwells at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, as it says in the creeds. And he sent the Holy Spirit to be with us forever. But we have to respond to him. Um, we have to repent of our sins. We have to ask his forgiveness. Uh, and we have to, if we want to be Christians, invite him into our lives. If we want to experience life with him. It doesn't just happen. We have a choice. God's given us free will. Um, and actually the realisation that we have to do that, that we have to invite him in doesn't dawn on us automatically. It certainly didn't dawn on me. I was um, I was telling them at the 9:30 service. I, I, if uh, if it's a good thing to have a, a Methodist pedigree, I probably have it because my parents were both Methodists. Both sets of grandparents on both sides were Methodists. Uh, my great grandparents were Methodists. There were smatterings of local preachers and ministers among them, and I was born into it. And um, and yet, it didn't dawn on me until tw I was 20 years old that I needed to invite Jesus into my life. Um, and that's what I did when I was 20. I'd actually been a member of the Methodist Church for four years before doing that. And it sometimes happens that a movement, a Christian movement, gets going with great impetus. It's like a wave breaking on the beach. It starts as the 18th century evangelical revival did with great power and zeal and vibrancy and people are really enthusiastic for it um, and indeed that probably lasted well into the 19th and even the 20th century with great work being done great people of God who were really fired up with the spirit and um, and fervent uh, followers of the Lord Jesus uh, but the problem is that with any Christian movement whether it's the Methodist church or I was reading about the Mennonites, the uh, Amish people of America. Often these things start uh, as a great um, movement, but they lose their power, just like a wave breaking on the beach, and it trickles up the beach, and then it goes, goes back down. And um, this can happen. And um, so it's not necessarily an odd thing that I should have been brought up in a church where probably it was... Um, settled into social respectability. There was a great work going on for social justice, but the idea of having a personal relationship with Jesus was something I didn't encounter until, actually, I was at university. And I wonder whether it's a similar situation that John faced when he was writing this letter to the early church. Sixty years down the line, the baptism in the Holy Spirit of the second chapter of Acts had already taken place, the early church had been birthed in zeal and enthusiasm and there were miracles and healings and marvellous things happening. And yet by the time we get to the time John was writing, it seems to have all died down a bit. And uh, the letter is written almost certainly by the same John, John the Apostle. We talk about James and John. Well, it was that John, we believe, that wrote it. The same John that wrote the Gospel of John, the same John that wrote the, um, the other two letters. If you look at the back of the Bible, just before Revelation, there are one John, two John, and three John. And they're just three short letters that John wrote to the church. We believe the same author. They were probably written from Ephesus, where John spent many years uh, in his older life. Um, they were probably written about 90 to 100 AD. Scholars are sort of divided on the exact time, but quite late on in the Christian church, in the canon of scripture. Um, but it's obvious from the content of the letter that John really loved the people to whom it's addressed. 
He was deeply concerned that they shouldn't drift away from the truth into um, fanciful, fashionable ideas that were actually false and that would lead them away from Jesus. He didn't want them to be deceived in any way. He wanted them to experience joy, joy of Christian living. And that's one of the things we shall be looking at in a moment. If you look at verse 4, the one that Dave alluded to a moment ago. He wanted them to shun darkness and to live as children of God. That's um, centered on in chapter 3, whoever deals with that in three weeks' time. Um, he talks about walking in the light, and that's something we'll be looking at this morning at verse 7. He wanted them to avoid sinful lifestyles and to know that if they did sin, they could immediately repent and confess it to Jesus and know his forgiveness and he wants them to love God and love one another and in fact at the end of the letter in chapter 5 verse 13 he wants them to know um, that they are saved that they have eternal life John Wesley used to talk about the, uh, the doctrine of Christian assurance. And what it basically means is just knowing that you are saved, knowing that you do belong to Jesus if you've given your heart to him, and that when you die, you will be in heaven with him. Lots of people in the church, you know, from time to time say, well, I hope that I'll be in heaven. I hope that I've done enough to get there, which, of course, isn't the issue, because it's not what we've done it's what Jesus has done for us and us by faith in him appropriating what he's done and uh, saying to God the Father, as it were, Lord, don't look at me and my sinful nature, but look at Jesus. And uh, so the doctrine of assurance. Anyway, we haven't time to go into that now, but that will be looked at in uh, chapter 5. So that's a very quick overview of the letter. Uh, we're looking at chapter 1, which seems to have four specific concerns. We'll look at them in turn. The first one is the reality of the incarnation. The second one is the joy of the Lord. The third one is light and darkness. And the fourth one is sin and forgiveness, which I'm going to look at together. So first of all, we turn to the reality of the incarnation. And it is central to the good news of the gospel that Jesus was fully God and fully human. We recite it in the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. It's basic to our faith, or as Charles Wesley puts it very succinctly and cleverly in one of his hymns, Let Earth and Heaven Combine. He says, our God contracted to a span incomprehensibly made man we don't understand how it happened but it did happen and this is the truth that John is concerned that the people to whom he's writing should know a fashionable philosophy called Gnosticism had cropped up um, in the late centuries of the first um, the, first the, first, the, the, the latter years of the first century, I believe it uh, originated from Greece. The Greeks were all great philosophers. They loved talking and philosophizing. And this particular um, philosophy was infecting the church of the time. In essence, it believed that spirit was good and that flesh and physical things were evil. And um, it denied that Jesus was really a man it made out that he was actually Christ the Spirit and that he was somehow divorced from the suffering humanity of Jesus so that, for example, when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't really suffer, that he, uh, his spirit moved out of his body and his body may have suffered, but his spirit was, you know, didn't suffer because they couldn't get around the fact that they believed spirit was good, body was bad. Therefore, if Jesus was, go was God, he couldn't possibly have been a man. And this philosophy was infecting the church. Um, it was a very exclusive philosophy. Only certain people with special knowledge and ability could aspire to it. And they tended to write off the ordinary, everyday people who weren't as clever as they were, um, who couldn't um, attain the level of spirituality to which they themselves were aspiring, this very high level of being in the spirit. And uh, so they looked down on uh, people in the church. And you can imagine within a church, it was extremely divisive. Um, like some fashionable forms of spirituality in our own culture, it denied the gospel message. 
Um, it wanted to replace it with something that was intellectually acceptable, but uh, which was accessible only to clever people and the, you know, the esoteric, the, the, the just the few who were able to um, to access it. And it threatened to destroy the church from the inside out. Um, now, in our day, we say, well, what is Gnosticism? We've never heard of it. It's um, it's something that's no big deal, but it was a massive deal in John's time. Some Gnostics believe that it didn't matter what you did to the body. You could engage in all sorts of immorality because it was only the body you were defiling and the body was evil. Therefore, you could do what you liked. And you can, again, imagine uh, immorality going on in the church and how divisive it was, completely contrary to the teachings of Jesus and indeed the Old Testament as well. And John challenges this. He says, Jesus is real. He wasn't, just, he wasn't just some vague spiritual philosophy. Jesus is real. John knew him. He heard him. He saw him. He touched him. Um, he really did die. And he really did rise from the dead and appeared to numerous people on numerous occasions, including, of course, to John himself. Uh, there was the occasion when Jesus appeared behind closed doors um, and John saw him. And, um, you know, Thomas saw him the first time, of course, some, Thomas wasn't there when Jesus appeared. And he said, you know, to convince me, I just will not believe unless I place my finger into the nail prints in his hands and my side, my, my hand into his side. And then Jesus appeared to Thomas and he said, my Lord and my God, because he could see that it was real. Jesus was a tangible person. He wasn't a ghost and, um, and John's wanting to convey that to his listeners. At the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles, uh, we believe that to have been written by Luke, he says um, that Jesus did, in fact, uh, give many convincing proofs that he was alive over a 40-day period. That's Acts chapter 1, verse 3. That was before Jesus was taken up to heaven, uh, after which, of course, he promised uh, the Holy Spirit and it was the Holy Spirit that really set the church on fire. And that really is what sets Christianity apart from all other religions or philosophies or beliefs. Um, the fact that it is based on a personal relationship with a real person who, yes, he did live and tread this earthly path, but he also died and was raised from the dead and came to be with us by his spirit and is with us now. So it's not about... Um, the other philosophies and religions and isms that, uh, you know, would want us to follow a prescribed set of rituals or believe a philosophy or go along with a set of teachings which you've got to learn and practice. I mean, obviously, we have to live by Jesus' teaching. But the point is that the first thing that happens is that we come into a personal relationship with him and then all these other things are added to us. Um, it's the personal relationship that comes first, and it's as real today as it was then. We can know him, we can love him, we can be loved by him. And John starts the letter by giving his own personal testimony of the reality of it all, so that his readers uh, may know it's true. Um, during some of our local arrangement services, people have given personal testimony. And in fact, I've sometimes uh, perhaps been preaching elsewhere and I've come uh, in late and people have said, oh, we've had a great time this morning. It was local arrangements and we don't really need preachers. And uh, they've, they've just enjoyed the personal testimony so much because it does have a power and it does raise our own level of faith when we hear how God has really worked in the lives of other people as well. Um, you know, some people have testified to how they've become Christians, others how they've been going through a particularly difficult time in their lives, and maybe something from the Bible has just jumped out at them and it's really helped them through a hard time. Um, with others, I know you've talked about hymns or um, worship songs that have meant something to you particularly at a time. And these personal testimonies are very powerful. And that really is what John is doing here. Um, we often share things like that in our home groups when you can perhaps talk about things in more depth. 
uh, things that have happened to you during the week, awful situations perhaps that have cropped up that we're able to, you know, bear one another's burdens and pray about them together uh, before we, 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 the, the meeting ends. So we do need to know that it is real. Uh, we need to know the Lord's strength in our lives and we need to prayerfully be able to support each other. And that really is getting back to basics, which is what John was wanting to do with this early, the early church at this time. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I want to focus on is the joy of the Lord, which uh, Dave has introduced very well, which is in verse 4 where um, John says, we write this to make our joy complete. Actually, some ancient texts say to make your joy complete, but it doesn't really matter. It's to make the joy that exists in the church among the body of believers complete. And that's John's intention. He doesn't want us to be staid and respectable. Nothing wrong with being that, but he doesn't want us to kind of stay there. Uh, he doesn't want us to get involved with ideas and lifestyles and philosophies and beliefs which deny the gospel and deny God's truth as revealed in Holy Scripture. Uh, in his day, it was the, the Gnostic heresy. And we've not heard of it, and it came and it went. But it really did do some damage whilst it was there. In our own time, um, I suppose in the pick-and-mix culture in which we live today, where anything goes, that also can lead us away from the truth. So... John takes us back to basics. Joy is what he wants us to have. And the thing we uh, learned in Sunday school, we were thinking about this in our home group on Thursday. Um, joy, we were taught it was uh, J-O-Y. It's like an acrostic. Uh, J, Jesus first. O, um, others next. And then Y, yourself last. That is the way of joy. That's what leads to true joy. And yet it's a strange thing, isn't it? Because it's paradoxical. You'd have thought that if you put yourself first, you would experience more pleasure and, uh, you know, uh, your life would be a better life if you, if you looked after number one and then bothered about perhaps your family and others. Um, Jesus, well, he may not even be on people's radar or if he is, maybe uh, only in a very small way. So our natural inclination is self-first, um, self-discovery, we hear a lot about it, don't we? Self-actualization, um, self-realization, getting to know your inner self. Um, me time, which is something that we all like to have. And yet, Jesus didn't have a lot of me time. He had a lot of God time. And... Uh, Basically, our natural incl inclination is that we are quite selfish and we would rather put self first, others next, and God last, if at all. But we live, it's not surprising in a way, because we do live in a culture which is obsessed with doing what we want to do. It's called individualism. Um, and yet, contrary to that, Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, they must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So it's quite the reverse. In Isaiah, there's a little passage where it says, it's God talking through the prophet Isaiah, and he says that my ways are not your ways and your thoughts are not my thoughts because actually in our relationship with God, it's often exactly the opposite to how it is in the world. It is the person who's the servant who actually God will honour, not the person who is, has dominated people and sought to be served. Um, so it is very countercultural. Um, how do we put Jesus first? We were asking this question in the home group on Thursday. It's all right saying it, but how do you do it? And we were thinking, well, first of all, by committing your life to him, you know, it talks about dying to self and living to Christ is really the first way. Spending time with him. My Aunt Elizabeth, uh, my late Aunt Elizabeth, she used to get up at six o'clock in the morning and have what she called her quiet time. She would read the Bible. She would pray. She was a Methodist minister's daughter, actually. Uh, but that's by the by. She just did it because she believed it was right to give God first place. And she used to write letters to people, actually, at, at, during those quiet opening hours. I've tried to 
emulate that as far as I can. You know, I don't get up as early as Auntie Elizabeth, but I do spend time with the Lord first thing in the morning. I find that's a good time for me. Some of you may find another time good to focus on him and to give him some of our time. And actual fact, if you start the day with Jesus, it doesn't half make the rest of the day go a lot better. And um, what else? Well, by worship and thanksgiving, I guess the fact that we're all here in church this morning, we've put Jesus first. I mean, it's easy to put so many other things first on a Sunday, isn't it? But to come here and to worship is an example of putting Jesus first. Um, to apply the little mantra, if you can call it that, what would Jesus do to every situation? Um, something crops up, somebody says a harsh word. And you think, what would Jesus do in this situation? And to try and put him first by reacting as he would. Um, to be able to say sorry when we sin and upset him. And the more we put him first, other second and self last, the more we will experience the joy of the Lord in our lives. Nehemiah in the Old Testament, chapter 8 and verse 10, says the... Um, what is it? The joy of the Lord is your strength. So if joy gives us strength, I expect loads of us need strength in our lives. So go for the joy of the Lord. Put Jesus first. And Jesus himself, of course, again, extending the paradox, he says that unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Most people would think it was crackers to say that it is by dying that you live. And yet, in, in the, the Christian way, in, in God's way of doing things, uh, that is the way that it is. Jesus was a servant. He died that we might know life. So that's the joy of the Lord. The third and final thing that I want to look at this morning is light and darkness. The last few verses of the passage are stressing the importance of walking in the light. And um, it says that God is light. So that if we're in step with him, we are in the light. And the light is in the passage, you'll notice, linked to the truth and, um, and to fellowship with Jesus and to fellowship with each other. And, of course, the alternative to walking in light and truth with the Lord is to walk in darkness without him. And if we do that, John says, we, sadly, we lie and do not live by the truth. We're on our own because we're out of fellowship with him. And it can happen, I think, in two ways. Firstly, we can deliberately choose darkness. We can, you know, sometimes we can be brought up in the church and we can decide, well, I've had that, I've done that, I'm not going to do it anymore. And we can walk away. Uh, more often than not, people have actually had no experience of it and they simply live a life without reference to God. And he, of course, respects our choice because he has given us free will. But however much we strive to attain, no matter what lifestyle we attain, no matter how much money we make, how many amazing holidays we go on, how far we travel and how much travel we do, how many lovely things and lovely people we surround ourselves with, it will strangely evade us the, the happiness and joy we're looking for if we don't do it God's way, if we don't put Jesus first and uh, others next and self last. And we'll miss out on such a lot because that joy is only experienced, again, with this strange paradox, by dying to self and knowing the new life that uh, Jesus, Jesus gives us in all its fullness. It talks about abundant life. We miss out on that because we've rejected God, and that actually is sin. It's the, apart from any other things, it's the breach of the first commandment, which says we are to love the Lord our God. I was looking at my Bible reading this morning, uh, which was uh, Jesus having a set to with the Pharisees, and uh, They'd asked him a question and he said, well, you know, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and mind. And the second, which is also really important, is to love your neighbour as yourself. And in a sense, the gospel 
and the, uh, the law and the prophets, everything hangs on those things uh, and it shut them up. But um, it is true, isn't it, that if we don't put God first, it is sin and um, there we are. Um, the thing that John is saying, please, please do avoid sin. But the first thing we've looked at really is intentional sin, which is where we decide we're just not going to have God in our lives, and that's that. The second way in which we can end up in darkness and there being a barrier created between us and the Lord is that we sin, but we don't actually mean to do it. Um, we fall into sin, we just do something, uh, but then we repent of it, which means being genuinely sorry and... Um, we come to the Lord and we say, we did this thing, we said this thing, we didn't do what we ought to have done, and we repent of it, which means intending not to do it again. And we confess it, and it says that uh, he's, he gives us forgiveness. Uh, he's faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the thing done or said or thought or not done may have been a deliberate act, it may have been... It may have been something done accidentally. It may have been something that we, um, we did out of weakness. Um, there are all sorts of ways in which we it could have been something that we're provoked into doing. And yet, uh, if we recognize it for what it is and repent of it, then Jesus forgives us immediately and removes the barrier. And that lovely light comes flooding back in once again. The blood of Jesus, John says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus, God's son, purifies us from all sin. It's nothing we've done. It's all that Jesus has done. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 26 talks about Jesus having died for our sins once for all. It doesn't have to be done again. It's a once and for all process. We can't earn our salvation. It's only because of what Jesus has done. And we've said, Lord, I want you in my life so that I can appropriate what you've done once and for all into my life with all the sins I've ever committed, will commit, and, uh, and so on into the future. We, uh, we get up, we dust ourselves off, and we go on, hopefully, in his strength, in the power of his spirit. So if we've committed our lives to him, God looks at Jesus and not at our sin. It says in John's gospel at the beginning, the, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's in verse uh, 29 of the first chapter of the gospel that this same John, we believe, wrote. So saying we're sorry can be really hard, but nonetheless we have to do it. Mary, my wife, was... Um, Going through our grandson's uh, little, by, uh, little bedtime story with him earlier this week, um, and it's a kind of it's a, it's a little passage that's got a moral uh, saying to it. It's been about um, saying sorry to people, and uh, Caleb's only four years old. And uh, at the end of this little reading, it said, "Do you know anybody who finds it hard to say sorry?" And there was a pause. And Caleb said, I find it really hard to say sorry. And he does. We've seen it sometimes. He knows he ought to, and he eventually does it. And sometimes he bursts into tears with the relief at having done it, that everything's right again. But it is hard to do. And if it's hard for a child to do, it's no easier for adults to do. There are issues of pride about saying sorry, especially if it's something we, we feel we haven't done wrong. So we need to ask God to give us the strength to do it. But when we do it, it makes a whole, a whole new difference. Uh, there's a massive difference to the person who says, I'm going to live completely without God. I don't want God in my life. I'm going to live in the darkness. They're probably not thinking of it in those terms. And the person who is a Christian who is trying to live in the light um but um yeah who who needs to come to jesus uh, saint paul said didn't he that you know i try to do what, what the right thing but i find that you know whatever's in me makes me do the wrong thing what a wretched man i am and if he felt that how must we feel on occasions but we confess our sin 
and uh, there is forgiveness from Jesus in it. And there's a massive difference between living in sin and darkness and denial and sinning and confessing and being forgiven and sinning and confessing and being forgiven, which is really in a way what the Christian life is like because Romans says that, you know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I've done it and continue to do it. You've all done it and you continue to do it. But we come before Jesus each time and we say, Lord, I'm sorry I blew it. Please forgive me. Help me to get up and do better and to live in your strength. So we conclude with the words of John that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and for the truth in it. Help us to live as children of the light. Help us to confess our sin and to know your forgiveness. Help us to live hand in hand with you and to know your joy and to put you first, others next and ourselves last. Lord, we commit all these things to you. Help us to know that you are a living reality in our lives not just somebody who lived years ago, but you're with us now, the unseen guest in this place and in our lives. Help us to give our lives to you afresh and to live in your strength through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.